Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan, and my guest today in episode 21 is Tony Moore. He was one of the original team recruited to work at Fairfax Media's new online news outlet when it was launched in 2007, and today he remains one of only a couple of reporters who has worked at Brisbane Times since its inception. Before that role, though, Tony has enjoyed a long career as a journalist in Queensland. I first met him about a year ago when I sent an email to ask whether he'd be open to sharing one of his sources with me for a story I was working on. This type of request can go either way, as some journalists are extremely protective of their sources and wary of sharing with their workmates, let alone a freelancer like myself. But the fact that Tony welcomes me with open arms says a lot about his character. We met at his home in the inner city suburb of West End on a Friday afternoon in March, when he and his Brisbane Times colleagues happened to be on strike for the day, in solidarity with their colleagues in Sydney and Melbourne, after Fairfax Media announced plans to cut 120 full-time equivalent jobs from newsrooms at the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. We began by speaking about what these job losses will mean for consumers of Australian journalism, before moving on to discuss Tony's early interest in environmental sciences and the link he has noticed between science and journalism. His early years working at the Queensland Times in Ipswich, where he saw the rise of an influential figure in Australian politics from up close. The character traits he has observed about the young reporters who excel in this business. Why he lost the ability to speak for several months and how he overcame this affliction. And how a long-running series of stories led to the funding of a major Queensland infrastructure project. Introducing Tony Moore, senior reporter at Brisbane Times. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Andrew. My pleasure indeed. It's uh, just after 1pm on Friday, 18th of March. Uh, Usually you'd probably be at work right now, but why are you not at work, Tony? Uh, I work for the Brisbane Times as part of the Fairfax organisation, and yesterday Fairfax journalists learnt that our senior management have decided to uh, get rid of 120 journalists. Well, they, they need to reduce the workforce by 120. So uh, our Sydney and Melbourne newsrooms were on strike for until Monday, first shift Monday, and the Brisbane newsroom has chosen to go on strike for 24 hours. So I'm on strike. So I go back to work at three o'clock this afternoon. Mm. What effect <clears throat> will that have on you and your uh, colleagues here in Brisbane? In Brisbane, there won't be an impact straight away. You'd have to say that most of the job cuts are in Sydney and Melbourne where they have the large print, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and the Australian Financial Review. And Brisbane, there isn't a print product, though you do get the Sun Herald here sold on Sundays. But they, the feeling is there won't be any impact here on Brisbane. But I think for us... Our, we work in international area. Our copy goes everywhere. We just wanted to, you know, it's old fashioned solidarity with our colleagues. We just didn't, we wanted to show that we appreciate the diff- difficult situation they are in. So that's why we went on strike. And I think it, it, also, it was hurtful, I think. I mean, um, we'd been foreshadowed that there could be some job cuts, but 120 journalists? That's an awful lot of journalists. It's almost a quarter of Fairfax's staff. So I think we were hurt the same as the journalists in Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, Perth, and uh, other states, South Australia, I guess. We're all hurt by the size of the cutbacks. So that's why we're on strike. And blindsided a bit too, because yeah. I believe there'd been mm-hmm. some comment from management perhaps a month ago saying that no more cuts were yeah. expected. Uh, Fairfax cut 800 jobs, 800 journalists not so long ago. A lot of the 800 print... is just a phenomenal number. Uh, it it's is, isn't it? Them. It's staggering when you think the scale of that. So another 120 on top of that, plus there's all the cuts to the, to the photographers, which was about six to eight months ago as well. And... You know, there's all talks about copy being replaced or supplied by things, and that won't be in the traditional news areas, but it might be in the areas where people 
you know, they, they, they do their training, they, they build up perspectives on gathering sources and all that old fashioned sort of stuff and that seems to be going by the way. Contributors are going to be, will most likely go. So a lot of the colour from the famous people that you have writing for your sites, that's going to go. Um, and I think we understand you know, the move to digital. I mean, Brisbane Times is a digital owned site. We're terribly excited about it. We do it very well, we believe. But um, I think you're right. It was the blindsided uh, nature of it and the, the short sightedness of it. Um, yeah. So there's still a little bit of hurt there. We understand talks are underway now, and hey, the real world dawns on us as soon as we go back to work. So we work our way through that. There's no hard feelings. We understand we have to do it. So, you know, we take our stand, move on. Type of thing. Yeah. What was the mood in the newsroom yesterday when that filtered through? Were you there at the office? I was. I was at the Gold Coast. Actually, I was covering Gold Coast mayoral debate, and uh, I, as you do when, when you're you know, outside your office, you get your emails on your phone and that type of stuff. So I saw the email that said uh, I got a hint of it early in the morning, and then when the rest of the sites realised it was 120 jobs, the equivalent of 120 full-time jobs to go. So there could be more journalists go, but in casual capacity, so to speak. Um, I think it was a little bit of, like, shock, a little, to be honest. It was delayed shock. People realised, oh, they, they're still going to wind back the journalists, which produce the things that people read. And I think that's, that's the hurtful thing. I mean real estate agents don't write news copy, you know, or cadets don't fill out farm bureaus. I mean, there's a natural order of things which, regardless of the platform you work for, print or digital, there's a natural order of experience to provide the level to be able to provide the journalism that readers do trust. Uh, and I think that's, there's a little bit, not a feeling of betrayal, because I think that's too harsh. It's they are looking at cutting back casual staff. They are looking at areas where they don't get the return. And I guess in this modern age, that's the approach they have to take. But um, it doesn't stop it hurting. Mm. You've been in journalism for some time, Tony. Have you been through this kind of um, thing before? Uh, yes, I started up at Ipswich at um, Australian Provincial News which is a great place for any cadet to start off. You learn a whole lot very, very quickly. And APN papers went through a contraction phase in uh, the late 1990s. And I remember uh, APN, Australian Provincial News Journalists, actually going on strike for a couple of days because the same type of things were happening. And the approach then was to restrict any grading improvements so the journalists wouldn't get graded beyond level one or level two at the most type of thing. And there were some senior journalists, but the thing is that there was no natural progression and uh, there was some redundancies and there was some dismissals and things like that. And so we all went out on strike. Then I remember we set up a strike fund. I remember mm -hmm. sitting at... Uh, a house at East, East Hipswich is one of the reporters, Greggy Smallwood. Hi, Greg. How you going? Um, <laughs> small G, we had a, a couple of barbecues at his place. And so yeah, that kept the, that feeling going. And uh, to the, the APN management's credit, they eventually negotiated with the journalists reasonably effectively. And the issue at that time was reasonably well resolved. I mean, it went back to setting conditions for which journalists would approach their grading, gradings and that type of thing. So we have been through it before. Um, and as I say, Brisbane won't be affected, so to speak, here, but that's the difficulty that you have to go through in Sydney and Melbourne. They, they will then pitch their jobs against their friends' jobs and go, well, why should I keep, why should, why should, I should keep my job because I do A, B, C and D and my friend does X, Y, and Z, how can you compare X, Y, Z, and A, B, C, D? It's, mm. it's complex, complex and that type of stuff. But yeah, journalism goes in waves. It goes up, rides a crest. I guess Brisbane Times has been through a wave. We do quite well in Brisbane now. Um, and as I say, we're not directly affected, but Sydney and Melbourne, obviously they're going to be terribly affected. And the wave seems to be 
crashing in some areas down there. Mm. I care deeply about this uh, as yeah. a freelancer. I have yeah. many colleagues in the industry, of course, yeah. and uh, this will also affect contributor budgets probably across exactly. the board at Fairfax. Uh, so this is of personal interest to me, but do you have a sense of how much the average person out in the community um, is aware of what these particular cuts might mean for journalism in Australia? Um, I don't think so. I think... I think to a great majority of people who are time poor, they get their news from... Um, and I don't think they understand... I, I, this is a good point. I'm not sure that they understand that a lot of the journalism they, they now read through social media is actually written by journalists, so to speak. And they think that a lot of it comes from um, their friends on Facebook. But if you have a look over the last 12 to 18 months, there's been some very good pieces and all media outlets now put their stuff onto social media, on Facebook and Twitter and, and um, Instagram and things like that. And that is journalists, you know, full-time, part-time freelance journalists, as well as uh, you know, your, your, average, your average punter. But I don't think they understand the implications of cutting a 120 journalist job plus freelancers' jobs. I think most people tend to get their news from the television, the six o'clock news, even today. I mean, there's only seven stories on the news each night, and what they don't cover is outstanding. So it's it's to their the average punter. I think will lose out badly very, very badly, to be honest. They won't get the diversity of the ideas. They won't get the opportunity to get um, a second read on a story. So they might get one story, but they might not get the one the next day, which explains it in great detail, or takes a point of view that they hadn't really thought of, and they can then talk about it at the barbecue on the weekend. And all that type of stuff, I think, is the danger for taking 120 journalists out of the newsroom. Um, you know, because... Oh, the ramifications of it are, are terrible, to be honest. I think it's the kind of thing that people don't realise what they're missing until it's gone. Yeah. And at which point it's too hard to turn the tide back. Mm. Like it's it's hard to see any media organisation suddenly picking up 120 jobs or like those if those people if, if the job cuts go ahead and those people are filtered out into the job market or the unemployment market. Mm. They're applying for other people's jobs or mm. they join the freelancers uh, brigade with me. Uh, it's it's hard to see where that ends. Well, I, I guess they all end up going to the... Well, not all of them, but a good many of them go to the corporate communications area, which rewrite... Which is a worthwhile industry, but it's not. it's not journalism. It's... It's different, and I'm not sure people actually understand the difference between uh, a, a pitch for something, which is often positive, but the way in which it can be explained is far more fascinating and can, can be rewarding not just for that particular product, but can be rewarding for a community of people. Um, and I don't think people understand the ramifications of that. Then again, you know, there's a lot of very, very intelligent journalists in Fairfax's senior ranks, and they would have been through this themselves. So that's on the other side. You have to think to yourself, they've been through this themselves in their careers, and they're not naive to this type of thing. So I'm sure they're aware of it, and I'm sure they've had a couple of sleepless nights as well. So, hey, okay. it's hard. It's... It is part of the industry. It ebbs and it flows. It ebbs and it flows. And we're at a, an ebb point <laughs> right now. <laughs> really, yeah. Well, thank you for indulging me on that topic. <laughs> let's, let's try and find some, yeah. uh, perhaps some lighter material. Yeah. Where did you grow up, Tony? And how did you find your way to journalism? I uh, was born at Sherwood in Brisbane's inner, inner, inner west. Um... Um, Dad's a mechanic, my mum's um, a housewife. We grew up in a nice house out there, Sherwood. We went out to a strange little satellite suburb which was called Jindalee, which is in the centenary suburbs, which for you, sort of like a, 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 in those days, it's like Springfield is these days. It was a, it was, it was a satellite suburb. I remember the 
ads. It was 16 kilometers, 16 miles from the CBD, and there was no bridge across the Brisbane River. So we had to come all the way through Oxley, and we were one of those people that used to catch a bus to Oxley train station, which is something that a couple of transport dem dem demographers have pointed out to me in the past week, that Brisbane has lost that habit of taking a bus to a train station and taking a train into your, where you wanted to go. We've lost that idea. But I remember doing that and growing up as a kid out there and playing in the creeks and running up and down mountains. There was, there was 12 homes in the suburb when we first moved out there. Wow. It was a big farm by, run by the Cinnamon family. And um, we used to run around and do all those type of things that kids did. Play in creeks, dam creeks, catch golf balls, swim across the river, um, come back across the river, <laughs> look for strange fish, um, play sport and blah, 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 blah. And so uh, they went to Corinda High School, Griffith University to do environmental studies, mm. ran away to Sydney to join a rock band, came back from Sydney, did journalism and script writing. I loved script writing. You studied journalism? Yeah, so I did, I did journalism degree at Queensland University of Technology and was very close to deciding whether to do um, film and script writing or journalism. I did all the film subjects as well, all the script writing subjects. And um, everybody there was encouraging me to do film and script writing. And I, but I got a job as a journalist and I loved it. I went up to Ipswich at the Queensland Times, did my cadetship up there and was there for 15 years, um, which was a fantastic time. All right, let's pause. We're fast forwarding through a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about um, studying journalism at QUT. What year did you begin uh, that? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, because was, I, I, journalism degrees mustn't have been around all that long at that time. No. There's a guy... Uh, when was I there? Um, I've been journalist for 2015 and nine, 24 years, so go back 24 years. Um... Yeah, 24 years ago. So it, was, it, it wasn't a university when I first there. It was called the Queensland University of Technology. No, it was called the Queensland Institute of Technology. That's right. When I first started there, we used to do a couple of lectures during the day and almost everything at night. Remember, almost all the lectures were at night. And... Who were the um, lecturers Leo, there? Leo Bowman. All right. And he, I saw Leo about two or three weeks ago. He came into Brisbane Times to do... Uh, a master's in journalism type of thing with, with our editor, Simon Holt. And, and so I bumped into Leo. I, I, you still see them every now and then. Um, uh, there's a guy called uh, uh, Rose Petlin. I'm not sure if she's still there. She did journalism and sociology and that type of thing. And I think I, I used to, I, it was good fun because they'd encourage you to think. There was another guy there who, his name was Peter Young, and he encouraged th one of the early Iraq-Iran wars was being waged, forgive me, I can't remember. But I remember he encouraged us all to play like a mock scenario and that type of thing. And as reporters, you would cover it from a different perspective. So you went from that type of international studies down through the traditional, um, here, there's a courtroom, in you go. Somebody would go with you in the court and then you'd spend um, a couple of days in court doing court, basic reporting stuff from court and you'd be shown and corrected and all that type of stuff. And that was, that was invaluable because you went out to original daily and you very quickly ended up in court doing court stuff. So they were former reporters yeah. in university yeah. teaching the next generation. How That's to right, job. yeah. And there was radio as well. 4EB had a we journalists. I'm sure they still do it down as well, but you did radio journalism, you did um, production, you did... That was This is pre-internet, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So this is um, sub-editing, layout and all those type of things. Um, and I remember a couple of guest lectures from the Australian and I remember a couple of guest lecturers from the Korea and it was a good place. It was a good place. It didn't encourage you to, to think journalism was was an exciting place, an exciting industry. And it was also very grounded and very realistic as well. Like you, you knew that you weren't going to go and suddenly work for um, you know, as the bureau chief of the Australian or, or mm. something like that. But you had an idea that this is the type of thing you could do. Uh, and I was, it was a very positive sort of place and it was good fun as well as a young guy. Were you excited about journalism before entering that degree? 
Uh, yeah, I was. I, what, my what attracted you? My, my, I, my first degree was environmental studies. So I, after school, I did uh, Australian environmental studies at Griffith University, and that was that was wonderful. But in hindsight, I finished, and I wasn't even twenty one. I was quite young, and I ran away to Sydney and joined a rock band, and. But that that interest stayed with me, and I've always been very interested in conservation issues and environmental issues, and that passion stayed with me. You, you, you did real hands-on type stuff. You went and measured creek flow, and I remember there's this place called Rocky Waterholes Creek, which drips off the Griffith University campus, and we went and did site analysis way up on the top of the mountain somewhere, and followed it all the way down to a little creek there rock near the Rockley Hotel. If you know where the Rockley Hotel everybody is, mm -hmm. that's that's where it ends up. There's a little patch of swamp down there and you did water samples and suspended solid samples and we fed it into a computer. And in those days, you entered the data manually using cards. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember us all sitting in a big lounge at Griffith University entering, entering this data format on these little dot, dash, dot, dash type cards. Sound like I am bold, don't I? But that, that's the way it works. You... you you went out and weighed in the water, brought it back and measured it in the labs. And so it was very well coordinated and it was a, it was a good degree. So I did that and ended up in, uh, after I came back from Sydney, ended up in the Department of Environment uh, when Martin Tenney was the minister. She had coming back fast because I was over there recently. Um, and uh, Martin Tenney, and it, even though it was a conservative government, there was the start of an awareness of environmental issues back in those days. And I remember Brisbane Forest Park was the big buzzword around Brisbane. Um, there was an idea of drawing tourists through it to generate revenue and it wasn't necessary to bulldoze it. And you could generate um, like a, a degree of wealth through experience of people going back to these type of places. Um, and it was also, uh, you could do, now, do you probably remember the guy that helped save Morton Island? Um, John, John, John. And th that battle had just been won, so Morton Island was then protected as a national park. And in South East Queensland, you, you did get a feeling that that was going to be an important future thing for Queensland. And I think it is these days. I mean, tourism is a, is a big thing. We get lots of tourists come here for our natural environment and... Uh, yeah, it's an important bargaining tool for everybody saying the conservation aspects are such and such and such and such and we should level this out and we should wait and see, well, you could generate, for example, the Great Barrier Reef, the 60,000 jobs of the Great Barrier Reef, that's, that's an anchor point for every debate about that type of thing. And I th when I was in the Department of Environment, I was very young, but I had that feeling that that was going to be important. And in those days, I ended up in a sort of media area answering questions and things like that and writing letters and I thought, oh, okay, this is okay, but I think I'd rather be a journalist and research this type of stuff for myself. So then I went to Q, uh, QIT part-time and started journalism part-time and that's how I made the shift into a journalist job job. Is there a link between science and journalism in your mind? Yes, What's very that? much so. I think... I think the, the link between science and journalism is in terms of verification. Um, you should be, and it's not, not, a, not always overt, but you should apply a, a sense of rigour to an explanation, for example. Uh, there, there's a political party which has sent, sent me their, their costed estimates for a, a, an election which is going to be held on Saturday. I mean, it's a list. It's a list of numbers. So that's the type of thing where a journalist should apply scientific rigour, inverted commas, to it. Hmm. Um, thanks, mate. It, it's a list with numbers on it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the debate over um, ocean warming, we, we should see where, those, where the warmer currents are flowing and do those warmer currents vary over the last preceding five to ten years? Are they increasing? We should do a little bit more, I think, than simply reporting you know, person A with vested experience saying B and person B with vested experience that are saying C mm. and you get he says, she says type of thing. And it's, ju it's, 
it's hard to avoid that, but the pace and delivery that is the demand from the reader is so, it weighs so heavily on that. It's you almost feel well, I could go to scientific authority X, Y, and Z, and they could explain to me, well, has this changed in the past five years, or is this simply a cyclical event? We should do more of that. Um, yeah, so that's where I think science definitely plays part in journalism. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that what you just mentioned then about, um, I guess, balance. Like journalism mm. is about objectivity and balance yeah. in, in theory. Mm. And if uh, a political party is putting out something saying some set of figures, um, usually you go to the opposition and get a, mm. an opposing quote. Um, mm. d have you found that to be a worthy pursuit, or do you find it a bit tedious sometimes, like almost like false balance required to get the other side of the story? Uh, it, it's always important. You have to do it. Um, I th it, uh, the more time you spend in journalism, you do realise that um, there's less... You, you'll, get a, you, you'll get a statement, really, rather than a considered response. Uh, yeah... I think it depends on which area you work in. In the, in the political arena, it, it does seem to be uh, largely rhetoric. I mean, the current debate about Queensland's infrastructure plan, mate, there, aren't, there, aren't, it, there isn't an infrastructure expert in the categories. They're nice guys, but... <laughs> and, uh, for example, I would rather see a large politically neutral body, something like Engineers Australia, something like that, ratify an infrastructure plan for a government and say, like Infrastructure Australia theoretically does on a federal level, rather than having a group of five North Queensland MPs riding over it. I mean, they mean well, mm. but how, how, how do you balance the needs of North Queensland against the balance of Central Queensland against against the political narrative of needing to hold seats, seats in South East Queensland? Politicians aren't the way to do that. You need to have an infrastructure association or a politically neutral body to do that. So that's one example um, where you find an answer is coloured by political rhetoric too much. Mm. Um, I guess the TV news, it, it, it's forced to do that. I mean, it, it does a good job in going person A says B, person B says this, and, and you can read between the lines. Um, but gee, there's a long way to go between that and a good, well-fleshed-out story. <laughs> Do you think your journalism degree prepared you well for that first job with the Queensland Times? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no. And nothing to do with the degree. I think the court reporting did. I think the deadlines did. Um, I think uh, the writing practice did. Um, but your first job is, um, okay, walk in, you get full stories from work today, um, this is what you're going to do. Um, you, uh, I, I think students that make the effort to go and do some work experience over Christmas time, they're the ones that are really keen, they're the ones that um, will learn so much more than if they just do their degrees. If you just do a degree, you don't get the habit of phoning somebody and... Um, uh, getting their sister or you know all those natural joke natural thing errors that you can make um, or you, you don't learn the art of recognizing that the person you're talked to from a small function you go to as a, a, a young cadet could actually be a senior executive one of the major employing groups in that particular town and so if you get their mobile phone number you can call them a week later when a bigger issue evolves and you can get a good national good follow on it and you learned that at a regional daily where you didn't learn that in your degree. It was those sort of common sense sort of stuff. Mm. Um, so, and I think when your first job, you should you know, tap into your chief of staff. And the, the chief of staff at most places have been around for long, long, long enough to sort of understand those sort of tricks and can help you. So, yeah, um, it did and it didn't. Um, it didn't, it didn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm always interested to um, on this podcast and ask journalists that question about whether they studied or not and whether they got much out of it. Yeah. Because your colleague, uh, Amy Ramikas, who oh, yeah, previous yeah, yeah. guest of penmanship, um, she does not 
think highly of journalism degrees. She thinks no. <laughs> she thinks journalism is like a trade where um, to go to university for is a bit futile because like a, um, a tradesman's apprenticeship, it's that kind of thing where you, you learn best on the job. I fully agree. You, you learn... I mean, I'll tell you, <laughs> on my first, day at my, my first day at my job, the photographer left me at a job because I asked what he considered was a dumb question. Hmm. But I got back to the newsroom and I had to walk back to the newsroom because he left me there. What? Um, it, it, the chief of staff, what was the question you asked? He said, no, yeah, it's dumb, but you got a good answer, did you? He said, yeah, use it in the story. Because the, the idea was, as a young journalist, you often feel nervous about asking questions. And I think that's the thing you need to break through. It, it's as much... Um, a performance, not so much a performance, but you have to put yourself in the job of asking questions. And as a young journalist, I wanted to get used to asking questions. The profession, the, the photographer, good bloke that he is, he has actually won a Walkley for, for his photography and is a, is a good, uh, a damn good photographer. He himself taught me a lesson that, you know, learn a little bit about the job before you go out there. Well, it was my first day, I didn't get the chance. But I learnt two things that day, and I got nothing to do with the degree. So, uh, what was the question? Do you remember? Oh, I can't remember. It was it, it was one of those things where the first day on the job started at quarter to nine, type of thing. You're out first pick pick story. I'm sure you would remember this type of thing. You go out at nine fifteen. You're at job one, and you knew it was going to be twelve to fifteen centimeters in the paper the next day, and it might have been, say, it was. Um, 15 new apprentices to be taken on by uh, uh, Dinmore Meatworks or something like that, you know? So you'd go down and talk to somebody down there, or the photographer would take a shot and you'd be last year's chief apprentice. Or, I don't know, something like that. It was a good local news type of story, which we've all done a thousand times before. And I must have asked something question, and I don't think, remember if it was actually there, but it was one of those type of jobs. And I remember the photographer leaving me there. <laughs> what an asshole! Ah uh, no, he, I, he he was rough as guts, but he he knew his job, but he he you know he he was teaching me and the hard way. <laughs> hard way. That's exactly <laughs> right. He didn't sit down and say, "Look, Tony, this is no, how no, you no, do no, it." He no, just no. fucking left. He just left. Ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, that doesn't matter. But um, you you, you do learn more in your first six months on the job than you do in your degree most of the time and I think it's because it's it's actually happening in front of you and you have actually have to do it and when you make a spelling mistake particularly back in those days people would phone you up and say my name's McEwen M-C-K-E-O-N not M-C-K-E-O-W-N mm. and you know you you learn pretty quickly hey check people's spelling Mm. Ticket when you write it in your notebook, all those old-fashioned things, and I'm sure they do it now. Well, you hope they do it now, but um, it's drilled into you, that type of thing. Um, I remember I had a at a at a previous job. There was a thing. I still remember this. Um, there was a famous map collection. I can't tell why I'm talking about this. Called the Noel Hodge Map Collection, and I went out to do a story with a guy whose name was Noel Hodgkins or something like that. And in the paper the next day, I described him as Noel Hodge because I had a mental association with that. Right. So all those type of things. And, and he called you up and said, Tony, that's exactly right. Yeah. So all those type of things. But, um, but then on the job, you also get the wonderful things of making a difference to somebody's life or... and they more than make up for the, the mistakes you make because, hey, we're all human. Mm. But um, you can change people's lives, you can expose things, you can point out bad things, you can cover things that are actually happening straight in front of you. Um, I mean, the emergence of Pauline Hanson was something that I grew up with at Ipswich. Right. As she sort of came from being the girlfriend of one of the councillors at Ipswich to being absolutely... Uh, the number one political figure in the country and it happened right in front of us right there at, at Ipswich hmm. and that was pretty astonishing to walk through that and work through that sort of era 
give a bit of context on Pauline Hanson for any international listeners who might not be familiar. Oh, okay. Um, Pauline Hanson ran a, literally ran a fish and chip shop in the in a, a city of Ipswich, which is uh, fifty minutes west of Brisbane, and she became over the over the so into the early nineties. She became an incredibly divisive figure because she. Uh, questioned the place of Asian immigration in Australia. She questioned whether Indigenous people should get separate grants to help them study. She questioned uh, whether uh, th there was going to be uh, a time in Australia where we would question the immigration of so many people from um, third world countries. But she did it in a way which was aggressive and I think she was allowed to be manipulated, although she, she always denied that. She always said to me and to all other journalists that it was her own thinking. Mm. But she became a very, very powerful political figure in, in Australian politics and became the Pauline Hanson Party, became, excuse me, the, the third political force, more important than the Greens, more important than the Democrats. Um, one Nation. One Nation, yeah. It became the One Nation Party. It actually started as a Pauline Hanson support group. Right. And it sounds like people trying to escape Pauline Hanson. That's, that's the right. way it's made. And it, it was <laughs> really, I mean, as I talk about it now, there's all these images I can remember from stories you'd wrote. You'd do, at particular times in her career, you'd have literally hundreds of people going to listen to her talk. And then 18 months later, I remember during a, one of the federal election campaigns, we we at the, the Queensland Times took two fo separate photographs. One at a meeting where Pauline Hanson was calling her faithful to a, a, a meeting, a campaign meeting, and one in the traditional Labor Party meeting, which is a traditional Labor sort of town. And uh, her hall was empty, the Labor Party room was full. You know, the election beforehand, it was completely the reverse. And you could see history changing straight in front of you just then and there. So. Uh, that was a dynamic sort of time in Ipswich. Um, so as a journalist, your your goal, your purpose there was to just just the facts, you know, report mm. what's going on. But as a human being, mm. um, how how were you reacting emotionally to what was going on around you? Was there a sense of incredulity or? Uh, it, it, yes, there was. Uh, she, well, Pauline, well, she's been present tense. I mean, she she's a. She is herself a very nice lady, very nice person, very warm. Um, I think she uh, she saw an opportunity for her to speak for ordinary Australians. And I think uh, she felt she was the voice of ordinary Australia for a long period of time. I think she was heavily manipulated by three gentlemen, John Pascarelli, David um, Oldfield and... Plus, being Pauline, I can't remember the name of the third gentleman, but they have, I, I think it's fair to say they heavily influenced what actually happened and, and created a large political party around some of those views. Mm. And I, I don't think she understood the depth of the issues that she was tapping into. And when she did, she decided to go with the wave rather than questioning it herself. And I think once people started to question what what's she actually talking about, it ran the course of most of those sort of political groups. Um, they last for four to five years and they falter simply because people get the chance to question and have a look at them. Hmm. And Pauline always says the media gave her a hard time and her imprisonment was horrible. That was terrible. She'd never have ever happened, but yeah. Did Pauline Hanson change the perception of Ipswich in your mind? I think that I think she did. Not specifically herself, but the the wave of things that generated around that. It was a coal mining town, the coal mines were closing, unemployment was a big, big problem. Pauline and the One Nation Party grew up from that sense of frustration. There was the early moves to have a university out there, where there's now a university at Ipswich itself. Um, all those UQ, right? A UQ, that's exactly right. So all those things 
bubbled to the surface at the same sort of time. It was a it was a region that had passed its previous glory as a coal mining centre. Uh, when I worked out there, the last the last of the open cut mines closed, and they now moved further out to near Toowoomba and Oki and all those type of things. And I think she was symptomatic of frustration, um, and she was very well known. I mean, she wasn't. She Pauline was very popular at Ipswich. Um, she served a term as a councillor there. <laughs> uh, so she wasn't an unknown person, but um, yeah, I, I, I think she was symptomatic of the change because then her, the, the, the university that became there, that has become um, symptomatic of uh, a new learning, so to speak. I mean, people can do trades. There was also a TAFE college at Bandamba, but I don't think, I think it, it, it contracted when the new university moved out and I think the new university has subsequently changed its course offerings to become more TAFE orientated as well. So yeah, I think she did. I think all that time changed Ipswich. Um, uh, little things like the, 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 the Walters boys and, and Alan Langer going to Brisbane and, and the, the links, that, that cultural link between Ipswich and Brisbane becoming blurred. It became a metropolis, so to speak. Mm. It became a bigger thing rather than the old days, the 1950s and 60s and early 70s, when there'd be grudge football matches between Brisbane and Ipswich, and that type of stuff, grudge cricket matches between mm -hmm. Brisbane and Ipswich. That sort of halted. It became one place. And they're still separate cities, but it's now with places like Springfield and Red Band Plains, and they're now a, a, a big urban megalopolis. But yeah. I think she was symptomatic of that changing times, yeah. Paul Pasali is also symptomatic of that changing times. You know, if people know who he is, he's the mayor of Ipswich and he's... How so? How is he symptomatic of today? He was a chemist. All right. So he was a chemist who... Um, uh, a quick-talking, smart-thinking bloke who eventually became the mayor, was linked to the Labor Party, still is a member of the Labor Party, but um, he's now an independent mayor. So he's been the most successful local government person, in I would say, in Australia for about four or five years. And there's all these suggestions that um, he uh, does things in an untoward way. But he's been exhaustively examined over the past 12 months, exhaustively examined. Mm -hmm. And he's coming up smelling, not of roses, but he's coming up clean. And anyway, his time has seen an incredible regrowth of industry out there. I think there's a feeling that um, what was a, what was a town of decline is now a town of growth, and I think that's they're sort of symptomatic of that sort of time. Yeah, gotcha. It's a good place to work. It's a good place to work as a journalist. Put it that way. <laughs> Just to digress for a moment, tell me about the year where you ran away to Sydney and joined a band. Oh God. I was very young. I uh, had a good friend. I uh, still lived at Jindalee, Lee, and um, he was a fantastic drummer. He actually went and played with um, uh, a jazz band down there, a uh, really good jazz band. Um, which name escapes me at the top of my head? Darren Perkins, really good drummer. And we went to Sydney, we lived in Leichhardt, I stayed with my cousin. We worked at this bloody market at a place called Birkenhead which was incredibly cold and we had no money. We'd have enough money for one cup of coffee. We'd get paid for trying to sell seashells at Birkenhead Market in the middle of the winter. <laughs> and the water would come off the harbour and come up through those old market bloody stalls and we'd freeze. And, what did um, you play? What instrument did you play? I played guitar yeah. um, and a bit of bass. And uh, we, we, we were trying to find other... Brisbane people down there to form a band with and we didn't, we didn't. We eventually found these guys from out at St Ives and a, pool, and a pinball parlour because one of the end jobs I ended up getting to get money was working in a pinball parlour <laughs> and they used to love ACDC so yeah that was good fun for a little while but I, I, my heart wasn't in ACDC and their heart wasn't in the stuff that I was doing <laughs> and so that sort of fell apart and then I had a car accident and didn't hurt me, but destroyed my mate's car. <laughs> so I needed to get a job to pay back, to pay back for the car. Right. And that's basically why I came back to Brisbane, got a job, 
And that's where I ended up becoming a journalist, basically. <laughs> to pay off your mate's rent car. Mate's car. <laughs> that's the best intro to the story I've ever heard. That's the truth. It was a, it was a, it was a um, Tirana SLR, SLR 5000, which had one of the earliest cars that had a foot brake. If anybody's old enough to remember the old foot brakes, rather than a hand brake, it had a foot hand brake. And it, it was a five litre Tirana. I wasn't used to driving a five litre Tirana. And it just bang accelerated at one particular time. Went over a, over a, uh, a garden in the middle of the road. It was a divided road somewhere at St Ives something. Over the footpath, up over a water fountain, bang into a yard. Uh, untold damage. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible embarrassment. Yeah, I can tell it's traumatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it stayed there for ages. But um, back to Brisbane, get a job, pay off in bit by bit. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. um, tell me about. I like what you said earlier about when journalists first start, they tend to be nervous about asking questions. Mm. That was certainly the case with me uh, mm. as a freelancer. I never worked in a newsroom, so oh. I uh, I was really had a lot of trepidation about picking up the phone and just calling someone for an interview or to ask them something. Like it took me a long, long time to get through that. So tell me a bit about how you uh, gained confidence and um, learned to. I guess lower yourself to ask dumb questions as needed. <laughs> uh, I don't. It's in in the newsroom itself. I don't think that that's much of a problem. You know, you've got four or five stories to do today, and you plan them out. So you go, okay, this one this one will take a little while to do. Um, this one I can do quickly. I'll make that phone call quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones where you need to, the person may not want to talk to you. I guess you, you make a start with that one because the person might not want to talk to you, can easily avoid your phone call, easily avoid your phone call. <laughs> so if you keep making four or five phone calls during the day, you finally get them of half past four in the afternoon. And as we all realise, there's one way to stall the story, just not talk to a journalist. Yes. And uh, um, I think it's just making yourself do it, really. Um, even Even at press conferences, there's lots of big egos and lots of big personalities and... I'm not a big ego. I don't have a big personality. At media conferences, I tend to wait until the the, you know, the normal questions are asked, and then I ask, "Well, you actually allocated this amount of money to that project two years ago. Why are you allocating less money to it now?" Or I, I've got the core stuff from the manual thing, but if you're looking for a particular angle on your story, mm-hmm. you can you can do it politely afterwards. I don't think there's any problem with doing that. Um, and I think most politicians can, or most people you talk to understand that not all journalists are in your face type of thing. And they, they to your face, they're usually pretty polite, really. Um, when they don't want to talk to you, they tend just not to answer the phone. <laughs> or they send you back one sentence, which, as a, as a written reply, which I guess as I get older, I tend to ring up and say, that doesn't answer any questions whatsoever. And I'm not can gonna, I speak to a real can person? Can I speak to please? a real person, please? <laughs> and I guess that does work. Yeah. Um, I guess it's a matter of just forcing yourself to do it. Yeah. You were at the Queensland Times for 15 years, you said. Mm. Um, how did your roles progress or your responsibilities change over that time? I started as a cadet, good old fashioned cadet, um, working on Sundays. Actually, no, I didn't. I, I was doing work experience there on weekends, I was the weekend reporter. So I worked Saturdays and Sundays and then got my cadetship and started. And uh, I started at uh, Ipswich, just being a general reporter in the newsroom, doing all the, which, uh, which we all start doing all the picture stories, learning to spell correctly, meeting the people and all that type of stuff. And I remember filling out my, my contact book and being very proud of having you know, a dozen or so real contacts and things like that in my contact book. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Uh, well, it's good fun. I mean, because you, you, as, a, as a cadet, you realise that uh, when you go to a regional daily, or even if you work at a, a metro as well, you'll quite frequently meet the mayor or the relevant minister for a particular project or... Um, uh, an industry representative represents that minister. So you can file their numbers away and go, oh, if I get a story about you know, sand mining or whatever, I can call this person, this person, this person, and I've got the mayor's mobile phone number. So it's ability, it's old fashioned stuff where you build up contact numbers, and then if you're brave enough, you can call them. And if you're working <laughs> weekends, 
you can call the mayor on the weekend, you can call the minister on the weekend, you can more than likely get a good yarn. Hmm. And I think that's the thing that you do learn from going out and doing all those type of stuff. Um, so I was a general reporter, worked my way. In those days you do general stuff, then you uh, do the afternoon shift and you do all the poli late night police stuff. So you'd start at, uh, I think in, my show, in those, those days you'd start at 2.15 and work through to the paper close at 11. And um, uh, you do all the afternoon police and late night police and the ambulance runs and all those type of stuff. And they are fantastic. You get great stories and you know, I, I, another <laughs> I thing. This is an afternoon of reminiscing. Mm -hmm. I remember um, a car that drove straight through a famous uh, famous golf club at Ipswich once. They drove the car straight through the front front of the uh, of this golf club, and they did it just before. No, it was about eleven o'clock because we got the story on the front page the next day because we managed to hold it. Not not hold it, but race, oh, sorry, you race out, get a, get a, get a shot. Because photographers in those days used to have scanners with them all the time. So mm -hmm. this particular chap, hiya, Aaron Hallett. Hi, how are you, mate? Um, he's now in the Middle East, but he, um, he would live by his scanner. Mm -hmm. And I think it was he that got a great photograph of this car through the front door. And being the young reporter you had the police numbers and you could call them call the station sergeant say hey what's happened i've heard such and such and uh, aaron's got a great photograph of it say oh yeah the car's just gone through we don't know who's done it yet but da -da -da, it's this sort of car and they're after this they're, and you, you're able to build up a good dramatic story hmm. so you do those afternoon shifts then you do court um and you knew what a QP9 looked like and you knew who the police prosecutor was because you'd met him during your police rounds days and you got to know the, the, the senior sergeants because they'd give evidence in court and you'd go through the whole range of different types of court stories you could do. Like, you know, is a swear word illegal? Uh, uh, all that range of stuff from shoplifting through to murders through to major arson events in the city. And then after that, you did local government and started doing Morton Shire Council when this strange super city called uh, um, uh, Springfield was first came to a local council. Springfield is now a city of 30,000 odd people just outside Ipswich and um, remember Ma House in Atambi and um, I forgot the other gentleman's name. Uh, they first came to the meeting with their plans for what became uh, Springfield. So that was seeing the birth of a city, basically. So you got to do that type of stuff then um, the, the drama of Ipswich and politics of the Ipswich City Council, which is, if you couldn't find a good story there every day, you're in the wrong profession. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and followed that for ages and ages, then became uh, one of the senior reporters and became the chief of staff. Then, what does chief of staff? What, is, what does chief of staff involve? Well, the chief of staff is the person that runs the newsroom, the day to day. So you do all the all the day-to-day -day assigning of stories to the individual reporters say I'd like you to cover this today and you follow as you as the reporters finish the jobs each day they come in and they say oh I've done this and this this is an interesting story this has got a good photograph mm -hmm. you'd ask photographers as they're coming in got anything that might be really good for page one or page three oh yeah I've got such and such and such and such and you'd slowly in your mind build up the paper for the day so as the day progressed uh, in our at our site you'd You'd give the editor a, a, a story list of, you know, like, a, so we've got these stories, these will be hard news stories, these are picture stories, these are down page panels, and you'd sort of literally shape out the paper right. each day. So you're a link between the newsroom and the editor? Exactly, you're a link between the newsroom and the editor. That's exactly what you did. So I did that for a large number of years. Did you enjoy that? I did, I loved it. I did. Um, but I could never stop writing, so that ah. was a, a, a problem for me. And, Probably not a good thing. <laughs> Probably not a good thing. So as you became uh, a senior staff member at the Queensland Times, you would have started seeing younger journalists yeah. coming through. Mm. What traits or um, aspects of their work did you notice about the ones that really stood out, the younger journalists coming through? Um, uh, being interested in asking questions. I mean... Uh, a young journalist that comes in and goes, um, well, why are you doing that? That prompts a great response from somebody rather than just 
going to an event and going, reporting the facts and getting the facts in the right order and all those type of things. Uh, and the photographers would give you an idea which one's good and how they fit into a newsroom and uh, you just watch how they fit in. Um, I can, in my mind's eye, I've got quite a few of them um, that always impressed me. Some of them, yeah, and the things that always struck me as one's well chief of staff was they were excited about their story. They'd ask such and such a question and they'd come in and they'd say, is this really about such and such and such and such? And sometimes it was, but sometimes they'd got a really, really good story just because they'd asked a couple of questions. So I think curiosity, I think it's something we're taught, but to actually see journalists being curious. I mean, there's a young lady at the Brisbane Times a minute who's doing work experience. She will be a good reporter. She's naturally curious. She doesn't write particularly well at the minute, and I'm not going to name her, but um, she's naturally curious and got a, a real love of language, a real love of words, and it's just a matter of shaping that love into a form. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm a particularly gifted writer or stuff, but I, you do tend to flavour your stories about the subjects for you know, what it is. Um, you're, you're a feature writer. You, you know the power of, of perhaps juggling the phrases of the words to make people quickly link into a story. For example, I was the Gold Coast yesterday and I was going to start my mayoral debate story by saying, Gold Coast, it's still a place where the property developers stop at the traffic lights in their BMW beside tourists astride a, a bloody motor scooter. It's still that sort of place. But you could write that for... You know, that, that makes people go, oh, that is the Gold Coast. You could think of the Gold Coast. But you couldn't do that in a hard news story. And I think you, if you see journalists trying to do that type of thing, you can see that they will be good journalists because they're trying, they're, they're questioning how they can do stuff. And I guess these days there's a couple of really good examples where journalists use you know, Twitter grabs and... Um, we link back to all our previous stories and journalists that make those online stories really rich so people can use them as reference points, not just as stories. Mm. I think that's that's fantastic. I think that is where journalism really is at its richest and its strongest. Um, it's just a shame we're going to lose 120 people to do that. Well, yes. How did you get from the Queensland Times to Brisbane News? Brisbane, Queensland Times to Brisbane Times? Um, Brisbane Times, right. I... I okay. <laughs> uh, I had four months off work because I lost my voice. Oh. My stress had got to me oh, at right. one stage. As chief of staff, and I was writing too much as well, and I literally lost my voice. I uh, as soon as I started to talk about work or anything like that, my um, my voice would go very gaspy, and I just literally run out of. I couldn't talk. Wow. Literally lost my voice. And it was just all stress stuff. And apparently it's not uncommon. I've actually, since then, I've met a, a lady who works at child safety, who has the same, had the same thing. And she had to have six months off. So I, I, I was off for four or five months and I went back for about a year or two. No, for about a year. But... Um, How did you treat it? time what were you doing during that time anything but work obviously yeah i built a garden in the backyard uh i painted the inside of the house yeah. i didn't i didn't do very much at all it's all just it, it's literally a small mental illness to be honest stress produced that in you mm. and i remember the journalist there being incredibly supportive and i remember I remember a chap who still works at the Brisbane Times, Philly Lutton, encouraging me to come up to meet the journalist after I'd been away for two to three months. And I've, that was absolutely lovely. And I remember after that, um, my recovery was a lot faster. I could, I, I could talk a lot faster because I, I realised that, um, oh, I don't know. I don't know what it was. But I think I might have seen myself as... A, as and I'm failing or something like that and so I lost my voice and I, mm. I could never go back there thinking that if I did I would lose my voice again but Phil took me up there and 
it was fine and a bit after that I, I went back again but um, mm. uh, I, I'd, I'd had enough I'd, I'd written ever, I was starting to write the stories over and over again after 15 years and I thought to myself it's time for something different and I was also all, I've always been interested in infrastructure development well planned infrastructure development and one of the things that one most important or well, one of the stories I hold most dear is upgrading the Ipswich motorway um, my chief of staff of the day sent me down to do a pick story with a man whose son had been killed by a truck and that little boy had been hit by a truck who, which couldn't stop at a set of lights on Ipswich Road before Ipswich Road became the Ipswich motorway and um, the chief of staff Mark Hinchliffe, hello Mark he said to me we're going to start a campaign to get the Ipswich Road upgraded, Ipswich Highway, or the link between Ipswich and Brisbane, improved to become a good motorway. Mm. And so for the next two to three years, gosh, probably even longer than that, I must have written hundreds and hundreds of stories arguing that case, going through RSCQ reports about bad, bad road design. Um, I remember I remember one year I followed every single accident on the Ipswich motorway mm. and did a table of the economic cost of each of those accidents. You can get that from the Bureau of uh, B... I can't remember the name of it now. Um, Bureau of Economic... Uh, I can't remember the, the authority. Anyway, you, you, they, they give an, an economic value to a fatality, the economic value of a serious injury and that, that includes the cost of an ambulance, cost of hospitalisation, all those type of things. You build up a cost mm. of what, say it was 350 accidents in the Ipswich Motorway that particular year. And I remember writing the story, it was some staggering figure. So this is the cost of the accidents in the Ipswich Motorway that particular year. You could build it for X, Y and Z. And um, Gosh, I remember doing it. Now that you've triggered my memory, I remember talking to all manner of federal infrastructure ministers and over a whole number of years until John Howard eventually um, came good with a, a proposal on one route. He was defeated by Kevin Rudd his first term and they proposed a different route, which is the route where it is on now. And um, it was built over six stages and the final stretch is that little section from Dowd Rockley, which Anastasia Palaszczuk sort of announced last week. Mm. Although it's $165 million shorter, than, less than it should be. Mm. And that money, and they're not going to, there's a particular road that they're not going to do as part of that upgrade. I don't only know that because I know the project bloody well inside out. Yeah. But I guess, I guess the point I'm making is that you can do this. A regional daily newspaper can be a very, very powerful place to learn your trade as a journalist, and you can make a big difference to a to a to a community if you do your job well. Clearly, yeah. Mm. And the link to the Brisbane Times. And one of my friends from that day, <laughs> um, I, I went to the public service and worked for the Department of Transport and Main Roads for four or five years and did sort of infrastructure studies and all those type of things. Oh. And I got a phone call from these two gentlemen one day and said, have you had enough <laughs> you need to come and work with us? We're going to start an online site. I said, oh, really? Those two guys were both sports reporters. Phil. So I thought, oh, I thought they were going to be an online sports site, see? Is this Phil, one of them? No, it wasn't. It was, his, it was a guy called Mitchell Murphy and Daniel Sankey. Okay. So Dan Sankey now works for News.com at the... Uh, is a fantastic reporter and a, a fabulous guy. And he and Mitchell Murphy, who's also a wild character, worked for News Limited for ages and ages and ages, and then for Fairfax for a while. And now I think he runs soccer. Uh, soccer. Sorry, Mitch, I can't remember. It, it's a big soccer job. He <laughs> lives at Newcastle or something these days. <laughs> um, they started Brisbane Times, and I remember them reading what say, you know, Timor, come work for us. Timor? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, that's where Brisbane Times started. They had the brief from Fairfax to start the Brisbane Times and they did all this stuff in secret for about oh, yeah, four or five months before word eventually got out to the Australian's media section and then yeah, we just let them know when things were going to happen and 
I think we launched in the March the following year type of thing. Yeah. What year was that? 06? Oh, uh, 06 or 05 or 06. Yeah, Peter Beattie was still Premier. So you were there from day one? Yeah. And you have been, so you're still there. Yeah, yeah. You are now a senior reporter, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What changes have you seen in the last 10 years, Tony? We're coming, uh, towards, <laughs> coming towards the end here. We are rushing a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm the last of the, last of the, the original reporters still there. Uh, no, Phil's still there. Phil still works for Fairfax's uh, uh, Federal Bureau, for the, 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 the Fairfax itself, rather than Brisbane Times. Mm. Um, I guess links to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those things are new over the past four or five years. Um, I... I I didn't realise their significance until two years ago. Uh, I really didn't. But nowadays you can see how, for example, my daughters, they get their news feeds from Facebook. We all do these days. Um, and then you go back to a homepage, don't necessarily go to the product per se. Although we do get, like most most online sites to get large numbers of tra- large traffic from the, the homepage as well. But um, So th- that's one thing I've noticed so much differently in the past two years. Um, gadgets. I remember when we first started, we had this bloody, um, it was called a jazz jam. And it was about the so- it was about four inches cube, four, you know, a four inch cube thing. And it had, you could take video on it. You could take, use it as a mobile phone. You could take photographs with it. You could then transmit all those type of things. And it was like a, uh, a Lego set in 3D that you'd juggle and fold. And uh, it was outrageous. We used to do training sessions with that. So that was Mitch's donation to the Brisbane Times. So we had those for a while. Then we, the mobile phones became so much better. We all just use the mobile phones these days. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the meshing of the Brisbane Times with the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age um, we, we really did feel, even though we we're part, always part of the Fairfax group, we, we really did feel like a small startup business in those early days. And we were looked upon as a small startup business. I mean, News Corp used to call us um, Fairfax Light in those days, and it was just a handful of us. <laughs> but they, it, we, they, were, they were worried enough to start you know, that, that bloody daily afternoon paper thing, which used to flood around the city all the time. Oh, yeah. I thought, Amex. Amex, yeah. So we worried them enough to do that. Uh-huh. Um, and so we've, we've just become a mature website these days. You know, we're part of the Fairfax empire. We do pretty well, damn well in Brisbane, thank you very much nowadays. Mm-hmm. We employ young people. Which that's, I think, really good. Um, Simon's got a well-established link with all the, the Queensland University technology and there's th- two or three young people in the newsroom every day. So uh-huh. that's really good. Um... It's a lot. It, perhaps some of the colour of the newsroom has gone because there's a lot more younger journalists in the newsroom nowadays, and I've, I'm older than most of them, all of them, <laughs> all of them, <laughs> and I tend to be a little bit louder at times, and they tend to be very quiet. But, um, but I guess we're now a mature news site. Now people know who we are, so people don't confuse us with uh, a weekly newspaper that. Um, uh, news produced on the weekends with the big real estate sections and things like that. So we are the Brisbane Times and yes. people know who we are. Yes. So I think that's the proudest thing from starting from a startup where people weren't quite sure what we did. Is it radio or is it print mm-hmm. or where, and, oh, when we first started, people always thought it was just a, you know, a, a nonsense before we started the paper. Yeah. So oh, it's just, oh, when are you going to start the paper? Yeah. Well, we ain't going to start a paper. We never were going to start a paper. <laughs> and, um, but we don't get that anymore. Um, we did put out two editions of a paper once, uh-huh. just for fun. <laughs> it was to do, it was a marketing thing, and we wrapped some great news stories around Clem 7. Clem 7 was just about to be launched and all that type of stuff. That was quite a few years ago now, but no, there ain't a paper coming. It's, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The last thing I want to ask you about before we finish up is um, this house. You wrote oh. you wrote about what happened to this house for mm. Brisbane Times some years ago, but mm. could you just briefly tell a story? Okay, so Andrew and I are at West End. West End was heavily flooded in, 2000, in January 2011. That's when Brisbane and a lot of Southeast Queensland was very, very badly flooded, and it's a little stucco cottage 
it was right on the ground. It was about oh, half a metre off the ground. And the floodwaters came halfway up the window, so maybe about five feet through the house. And uh, our family was actually in New Zealand when <laughs> it flooded. And all our friends emptied the house. So thank you, Sesco, Jeffrey, and all your friends. And <laughs> they emptied the house beautifully for us. And we were literally in New Zealand. And I read, came to a news agent to buy a battery for a camera. Uh, and I had to buy a paper, to buy a paper, to be honest. <laughs> and um, uh, I recognised uh, Daniel Hurst byline. Daniel Hurst is a, a well-known reporter in Australia these days, and he um, had written something about the Brisbane River breaking its banks at West End. And I thought, that's our place. <laughs> so all our family crowded into this phone booth at, at this place on the west coast of New Zealand, trying to call my sister to find out, has our house been flooded? And we eventually got through and said, yes, your house has been flooded, and your friends have emptied your house out. And so the house got badly da about to flood it and we got back the Saturday afterwards and it was pretty devastating. Mm. I remember the army being through the street and uh, rubbish being piled about, uh, you know, almost two storeys high outside the houses and things like that. Mm. But we eventually cleaned it up. We went and stayed with my wife's parents and my sister's place out at Annalee and we pulled all the timber out and pulled all the, the sheeting out and hosed it out and um, all our friends were very, very helpful and helped us clean it up, dry it up and we restored it with a little, little bit of help from the Premier's Flood Committee, a um, little bit of money, no insurance, thank you insurance companies and uh, we erased the house because the, the value of the house just sunk. Mm. Um, and so it's out of the flood level these days. Um, and slowly the trees grew back. And you know, when you sit in the back thick these days, and you start, you you start to think yourself, you know, it, it's now four or five feet above the flood level. So touch wood shouldn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> and even if it does, you know, the bottom, bottom level's up above it anyway. So, but it, I remember it took from January through to November to get back into the house. Mm -hmm. And. Um, it took a long time. And you were still working during that time? Yeah, it was. was. And, um, Fairfax used to give me, help me with funny shifts and I remember they they arranged a, a card with some grocery money on it, which was lovely, because <laughs> we used that for all type of things. You never realise how much you could buy at a grocery shop, you know, <laughs> until you get something like that, which was wonderful. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I worked and... I remember Connell Hanna was the editor at that stage, and I remember sometimes I'd just have to phone him and say, oh, um, I've just got too much to do today. Because you'd have concreters and you'd have, you know, site engineers and all that type of stuff, and mm. you just literally couldn't do everything. And I think there must have been some days when I sat in the newsroom going, oh, I remember in the, in the early days, that's something that people don't really think of is, how how do you how do you restore a house so to speak you you have to think to yourself okay hose it out pull out all the old sheeting put that in piles take some of it to the dump leave the rest for the guy for the the um, people that were walking around the streets helping you out and then what do you do how do you find somebody to help you you know renovate how do you find somebody and um our local councillor was really helpful to me and then the basically the friendship network around west end which i'm sure is in the same of other states they helped you find somebody to do this for you and somebody to do this for you and i remember all those funny little things like the greek orthodox community gave us some blankets and mm -hmm. pillows and all that type of stuff um, mm -hmm. um St Vincent's de Paul paid for a new, the new kitchen table over there. Mm -hmm. um, um, all those little things that I, we won't ever forget, mm -hmm. but I hadn't really thought of until you just jogged my memory just then. Mm -hmm. um, and all those type of things. I remember a couple of reporters coming through the house and being quite surprised because this was the house where Kevin Rudd did his media interviews from the back because... Mm -hmm. It was pretty bad. It was pretty bad here. Yeah. 
It's a long time ago, but it's a long time ago. Thanks we for recovered. taking time out of your strike day to talk to me, Tony. Appreciate it. I hope it's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, mate. God, you made me think. Thanks for listening to Penmanship, and thank you to my guest, Tony Moore. The audio from this interview is actually the backup recording because the primary microphone failed after I stupidly chose the wrong setting, which was the first time that's happened in 21 episodes. I think you'll agree that was still a pretty good quality recording, but I'll make sure that never happens again. I'm very glad I brought a backup. You can find show notes to this episode and all others at penmanshippodcast.com where you can also sign up to my weekly email newsletter, which this week celebrates its 100th edition. It's named Dispatches, after the book of the same name by the American journalist Michael Herr, which I love dearly. And each week I send out recommendations to articles and books I've read, as well as podcasts I've listened to, and links to my own recently published writing. If you'd like to sign up and receive Dispatches 101 onwards in your inbox every Thursday morning, you can do so at penmanshippodcast.com. If you would like to get in touch with me with praise, criticism, suggestions for future guests, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. You can also find the podcast on Twitter at penmanshipau and on Facebook. The theme song for Penmanship is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. That is all for this week. Until next time.